of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Ross Miller. I'm the Assistant Director here at the Quattrone Center, and I'm very happy to be uh, moderating this panel of very distinguished folks to talk about uh, a topic that is ubiquitous uh, in the criminal justice sphere, uh, and that is DNA. Uh, the title of the panel is Faster Forensics, and the reason why it's called that is because what we're going to talk about is the advent of what's known as rapid DNA, which is a new technology uh, that has the potential to really change the way that we're utilizing uh, DNA analysis in ways uh, that hopefully are good, but have the potential to uh, go south if we're not careful. So, you know, here at the Quattrone Center, it's our mission in general uh, to identify and eliminate causes of error in the criminal justice system. And you can't do that without looking at forensic practices. Forensic practices uh, as everyone here likely knows, have been abundant sources of errors. Uh, we've seen more modern iterations of question forensic practices and bite mark analysis and blood spatter analysis and drug field test kits. Uh, there are some of the old chestnuts of bullet lead analysis and hair sample analysis, uh, which have long now ideally been discredited or not being used anywhere. Uh, so DNA analysis has been one of the most reliable forensic practices in the criminal justice system. And it's perhaps one of, if not the most valuable tool for the actors in that system. It can conclusively identify a rapist or a murderer, and it can just as conclusively exonerate those who've been wrongly convicted for those same crimes. Uh, however, even though it has functioned as a gold standard, it's often viewed as by the public that way, it continues to raise concerns. Uh, especially in a situation where a mixture is present, meaning that a, a, a DNA sample shows that there's more than one contributor. Most recently, in a study published last summer, researchers from the National Institute of Standards and Technology provided a DNA mixture to about 105 U.S. crime laboratories and three Canadian laboratories. They asked those laboratories to compare it with DNA from three suspects in a mock bank robbery. Now, one of those suspects was not included in the reference samples that were provided to the labs. Out of 105 labs, 74 of those labs included the innocent suspect in the mixture. So 74 out of 105 labs, which are currently functioning as forensic labs in the United States and Canada, incorrectly identified an innocent person as a perpetrator. So the newest entry in this field, uh, in this technology of DNA, is what's called rapid DNA. And for those of you who haven't heard of it or seen it, rapid DNA is really referring to the technology in which the analytics are performed, which is a small box about the size of a small copier. It's relatively inexpensive. They're currently priced a little over $100,000, which in a typical criminal justice budget for a jurisdiction is not an enormous amount of money. And that technology got a huge boost last year with the final passage of the Rapid DNA Act uh, of 2017, excuse me, not last year, in 2017. And one of the purposes of the Rapid DNA Act is to allow the FBI to authorize the use of these devices to be able to upload their results into the CODA system and contribute these results that are being taken locally in police districts and include them in the CODIS database, which is the primary DNA database that's shared by criminal justice jurisdictions throughout the country. So for the police and prosecutors, this technology holds a promise of nearly immediate results, allowing quick arrests of identified perpetrators and quick exonerations of cleared suspects. And as it stands currently, rapid DNA machines are primarily used for single source reference samples, which means buckle swabs only. They're not yet reporting the inclusion of those results into CODIS. But again, because of the rapid DNA, that's expected to begin soon. However, since they're not using CODIS and they're not eligible for that, the jurisdictions who've been using the technology have been building local databases. You're going to hear some more about that today. And so around the country, there are smaller mini databases, some statewide, some countywide, where the DNA information is being collected and stored. So the question is, now that RAPID is here and it's cheap, what happens next in the environment that Justice Jackson referred to as the often competitive enterprise of ferreting out crime? And what do we love about this technology? What do we fear about this technology? And what do we do to prevent the problems that we've seen with the introduction of a new technology in the field of criminal justice? So in, 
As I said, many of you don't know me. I'll tell you right now, I am not qualified to explain the details of DNA technology and how it impacts the criminal justice world. But fortunately, I have found three individuals who can do that better than anyone else with respect to this uh, rapid DNA technology. So starting uh, left to right, you're going to hear today from Director Frederick Heron. Director Heron is uh, the Director of Public Safety for Ben Salem Township, which is a municipality a bit north of here in Philadelphia. And one of the reasons, uh, in addition to the other things I'll describe about uh, Director Heron in a moment, that he was chosen for this panel is that his police department was the first in the country to begin using the rapid DNA technology. Uh, as a result of that, there is literally no one in the entire field of policing that has more experience with using that technology than Director Heron. Uh, among his many committees and advisory board uh, appointments, uh, Director Heron uh, is the, on the International Association of Chiefs of Police Forensic Science Committee. He's also on the Federal Bureau of Justice Assistance Sexual Assault Committee. Uh, he's the author of multiple articles in the field of police forensics, including property crime and DNA databases, which have been featured in national police magazines. He was instrumental in implementing the first countrywide local DNA database in the United States. And he lectures nationally, and as of last night, I think I can correctly say internationally. Is that right, Director Aaron? I think he's, he's, he's added uh, the globe to his resume uh, on a variety of issues, including DNA, current drug trends and initiatives, school-based prevention programs, and domestic violence. Sitting to his left is Dr. Peter Stout. Dr. Peter Stout is the CEO and president of the Houston Forensic Science Center which is a local government corporation that functions as the forensic laboratory uh, for Houston. It's overseen by a nine member board of directors and has responsibility for and control of nearly all the city's forensic operations. The HFSC went online in 2014 and was created in response to rampant and severe problems in the Houston Police Department forensic divisions. At one point, the issues were so severe, the department's DNA operation was shut down and had to be rebuilt completely. The latent print backlog was so significant that Houston signed a contract with an external agency in order to be able to complete the work. After the National Academy of Sciences issued a report in 2009 calling for forensic laboratories to be independent of law enforcement, Houston city government took them up on that suggestion. And as a result of that, uh, the Houston Forensic Science Center was formed in 2014. Uh, Dr. Stout has been the CEO since 2015. He has more than 15 years of experience in forensic science and forensic toxicology. And prior to joining the HFSC, Dr. Stout worked as a senior research forensic scientist and director of operations in the Center for Forensic Sciences at RT International. He's also served as the president of the Forensic Science, uh, the, excuse me, the Society of Forensic Toxicologists, and he represented that organization uh, and the consortium of forensic science organizations. He's participated in national policy debates on the future of forensic sciences in the United States. He has a doctorate in toxicology from the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center in Denver, and he also served as an officer in the US Navy Medical Service Corps. Finally, uh, Dr. Greg Hampikian sits to Dr. Stout's left, and Dr. Hampikian is a professor at Boise State University with a joint appointment in biology and criminal justice. He is also the founder and director of the Idaho Innocence Project at BSU. Among his various research and teaching positions are Yale University Medical School, Emory University, La Trobe University in Australia, Clayton State University, and the CDC. His laboratory at BSU is involved in a wide array of DNA projects in the areas of forensic biotechnology, mitochondria, mitochondrial population studies, drug development, and bioinformatics. His work has been published in leading scientific journals such as Nature, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science and Justice, and the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. He's offered DNA workshops and seminars at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, Harvard University, and the Pasteur Institute. He's also, as I mentioned, the founder director of the, uh, the Idaho Innocence Project, and has worked in that capacity on DNA cases throughout the United States, the UK, Italy, and France, including nine exonerations. In four of those exonerations, new DNA testing led to a criminal database match. He is also the co-author of Exit to Freedom with Calvin Johnson, and that book tells how Mr. Johnson was freed from prison by DNA evidence after 17 years behind bars. His laboratory and legal research has been supported by the National Institute of Justice, the Department of Defense, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the National Science Foundation, among others. So by way of format, as much as I want to jump right into the discussion, because this is a complicated topic, what we're going to do is I'm going to have each one of the presenters come up. They're going to present for about 10 minutes, and 
explain what their experience is with DNA technology and rapid DNA specifically, and then we will get into the questioning. So I'd like to start with you, Director Horan. Good morning. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me here. My mother always wanted me to go to law school, but I guess this is the closest I'm going to get. Uh, so she's uh, she's probably well. This is the best he's going to do. So uh, being a cop is not uh, is not what a Jewish mother from New York wanted for her son. But uh, 33 years later, I'm, I'm still enjoying this job, so I can't uh, I can't complain. Um, my job. What, one of the reasons why you know we got involved, and I'll go into it in a few minutes, because I've never done a presentation in 10 minutes. <clears throat> is it's not about making arrests. I don't see my job as making arrests. It's part of my job, but it's not the most important part of my job. The most important part of our job in law enforcement is really preventing victims, not a making arrests. And sometimes we do that by making arrests. What I'm going to talk about for the next you know, 10 minutes is a most amazing tool that allows us to make arrests very quickly and get criminals off the streets preventing them from making more victims 10 minutes later. So let me just give you a little bit, um, I'm not going to go into Ben Salem Township, where we border Philadelphia. As you know, we are in the heroin capital of the United States, this area here, which brings a lot of crime, and there's a lot of crime because of the drugs. And that bleeds over into Bucks County. We're in Philadelphia surrounded by three other counties besides Bucks, Montgomery, Chester, and Delaware, and we're border Philadelphia on the north. We have I-95 that goes through us, the Turnpike, US-1. So that brings a lot of transient crime, a lot of crime into our municipality. Um, it's a big township. We're the ninth largest municipality in Pennsylvania. That comes into play because Pennsylvania, I'm faced with the rules and regulations in Pennsylvania, or more, should I say, with what Pennsylvania has to offer. And that is, Pennsylvania only has three CODIS labs. Philadelphia Police, Allegheny County, and then the other 1,100 plus departments share one PSP lab. So that's a lot of stuff going into one lab. What's nice about Ben Salem and Bucks County is we're not faced with the homicides and the sexual assaults, the unknown sexual assaults that maybe the larger cities are. Most of America, most of Pennsylvania is like me. They're faced with property crime, they're faced with burglaries, they're faced with robberies, they're faced with thefts. Thefts from stores, thefts from houses, thefts from vehicles. This is what we're faced with. And DNA, if we use DNA in those crimes traditionally, we weren't getting anything back from it. We would send our DNA, if the state even took it, 18 months is what the state lab turnaround time. Not because they're not good. They are very good people at the state police lab. The problem is they have a lot of work and not enough people working there. So they're not like private business. They don't hire more people when they're busy. So in 2010, I started looking for other ways of doing business. And we contracted with a private company in Lorton, Virginia. Why? Because if you could see from this slide, our, par our part one crimes, if you don't know what part one crimes, they're the major crimes. Homicide, thefts, sexual assault, arson, burglary, robbery, auto thefts, kidnapping. Those are our major crimes. If you look at Pennsylvania numbers, Pennsylvania, only 14% of the part one crimes make up violent crimes. If you took Philadelphia and Pittsburgh out of that equation, it would be a lot less. For Ben Salem Township, only 4.3% of my part one crimes are violent. So what's going on? 95.7% of my crimes we weren't utilizing DNA for. So when we discovered that we could use DNA every day for everything, we started doing that. And we privatized with a local company to create our own, I know some people don't like it, our own local databasing. And in March of 2017, we discovered RAPID. RAPID was an instrument that was brought to my attention. I was able to secure some grant funding, and we brought RAPID on board. And I'm going to talk about that and, and show you a picture of it in a few minutes because a lot of people haven't seen the machine. But what I want you to understand from law enforcement, from my perspective, now there's 900,000 law enforcement officers in this country, there's 18,000 police departments, 1,200 alone in Pennsylvania. So that's a lot of chiefs all over the country. So I can't say what everybody's doing, but we're trying to get everybody on the same page. And the FBI is about ready to publish best practices and the use of RAPID will be published very shortly. And I know that because I'm actually on that committee. But what we utilize DNA for, it's just a pointer 
It's just an investigative lead. We don't get a hit, we don't get a match and run out and throw handcuffs on someone with nothing else. That's not what's happening. It's just somewhere where we've had no leads to point us to an individual. And I know this is crazy and I've been doing this for 33 years but I don't understand. Once we tell people, the bad guys and gals that we arrest, and my numbers are about 94, 95%, they confess. Most of the criminals, once they realize we have their DNA, they wind up confessing to the crime. Why, I don't know. They do have the right to remain silent. A lot of them don't take that. But they do confess to these crimes. And you know, my opinion is that if they're confessing to this crime, and I'm not talking about long, lengthy investigations where you're having people in custody and then eventually as a confession or using other means, but if we tell them we have their DNA, they went, I'm not confessing that crime, but to multiple crimes because people don't commit one burglary, they don't commit one theft. So we are seeing a lot of these folks are, are confessing. Now I have 105 officers, only 20 are trained in utilizing the rapid machine. It is a fairly simple machine, but I don't want, we try to make it fairly cop-proof because I don't want 105 police officers putting their hands on it. So we have 20 of our detectives and some supervisors that are trained in, in using this machine. But again, this is only an investigative lead. We only use it as a pointer. A lot of times there's no other, uh, there's no other evidence in some of these crimes. So what happens? We arrest somebody for stealing from Walmart and we take their DNA and I'll explain that in a few seconds. We take their DNA and in our local database it sits. No long 18 months, in 30 days. So this is our own database. And then we process crime scenes, burglaries. And then we arrest this person, I'm sorry, now we arrest the person from a, a local store, a Walmart or something like that. We bring them in, we get their DNA and I'll explain that in a few minutes. We swab them, we throw it into the rapid instrument, and what do you know? In 90 minutes, in about 92 minutes, it hits to all these other crimes that this individual has committed. We interview that person, they wind up going for all these different crimes, and we could possibly get them off the street immediately, preventing them from committing another crime in an hour from now. Because face it, even in Bucks County, if you're committing a theft, a theft from a store, maybe even a burglary, you're not gonna stay in jail very long. But if you wind up where we're charging with three or four burglaries, chances are you're gonna be incarcerated a little bit longer and keep you off the street. And again, my job, using all the tools and the laws available to me, is to prevent tomorrow's victim. And if this is a tool and this is a law that allows me to do it, then we're gonna utilize it. Now, Pennsylvania is a conviction state. There's some misdemeanors now, but it's mainly convicted felon, but um, so how am I getting this DNA? People might be asking. It's consensual. Most folks, and again, we're in the 90s, low to mid 90s, people are giving us their DNA. Okay, well, we're coercing them, we're tricking them, we're taking it surreptitiously, we're threatening them, we're, we're, we're lying to them, we're, 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 we're cheating them, we're misleading them. This is what we're doing to them. This is the form that we read. I, free and voluntarily consent to provide a DNA swab to only be used for the purposes of criminal investigation. I have been advised I have the right to refuse permission to obtain sample at any time. I have also been advised that if I provide a sample, I may remove it from the database upon request. If I do refuse, I know the officer may apply for a search warrant or other court documents prior to obtaining samples. I know that any evidence seized may be used against me in criminal prosecution. That's spelling out. We've had suppression hearings on this. They swab their own mouth, they read it, they sign it, and it's all videoed. So this is not under any coercion. They know what they're doing. Now, why does someone give it up? For the Fred Harron opinion, I think criminals think, like a lot of the public, DNA, homicide, and sex crimes. I didn't kill anybody, I didn't rape anybody. All I did was break into houses. So I think that's why they give it up. I think that's a lot of reason why the criminals give it up. And we have a very, very high percentage of people that give up their DNA, and then it goes in our database. If you wake up the next morning and you think, what did I do? You don't have to hire a lawyer, you don't have to go to a court, or you don't have to even write us a letter. You can call us and say, hey, it's me, Fred Heron, you arrested me yesterday, I gave you my DNA, I changed my mind, I don't want it in the database. Out it comes. We take it right out, I don't play games with this. Truth is, there's no one governing what we're doing. I don't want nine people in Washington to hear one of my cases and make bad case law. So we're very, very careful what we're doing. We have about 27,000 profiles in our database right now. It affects all kinds of crimes, narcotics, property crime, violent crime. Why am I going through and, and bringing attention to ourselves and you know, some people don't like what we're doing? I have a 42% reduction in burglaries. 42% reduction in burglaries. The national average is about 4.5%. 
I have a 42% reduction in burglaries. And in the following year, that continued to a 65% reduction in burglaries, a 51% reduction in robbery, and a 46% reduction in auto theft. In 2018, with the use of Rapid, we saw another 26% reduction in burglaries, a 14% reduction in robbery, 16 in theft, 55% reduction in forcible rape. We don't get a lot of them. You know, we get about maybe a dozen a year, but that's half of it cut down. If you're the victim and you're in that half that didn't happen, you're going to tell me to keep doing what I'm doing. A 16% reduction in part one crimes. So. 2017, we got on board with Rapid, and Rapid basically runs in 90 minutes. Um, and let me show you. Oh, I don't, tell me I don't have that. There's the machine if you haven't seen it. It's just a black box. It sits in a secure room. You need a thumbprint to activate it. The machine reads who you are, and it starts its countdown. You put the DNA in the top left hand corner, or right hand corner, depending on the way you're looking at it. And 90, it just starts ticking down from 90 down to one, and it tells you whether or not there was a problem, and it makes an XML file, uploads in our database, and that's the end of it. And it searches against our database. There's a computer right next to it. Um, we have never had the lab give us a different result, because we do A and B swaps. You know, I don't count on this to be the end all, got all, because like I said, we don't run out and put handcuffs on people. But we do an A and B swap. If we don't have enough, we don't put it in the rapid machine. What we're starting to do now is, besides the uh, reference samples, we're doing blood, saliva, uh, chewing gum, and now cigarette butts. Cigarette butts from crime scenes that are abandoned. abandoned. We don't take DNA surreptitiously. Somebody refuses to give us our DNA, but we ask, are you thirsty? Give them a bottle of water and then take it off the cap when they leave. We do not do that. It's legal, but we don't do it. Why? Because I don't want to make bad case law. I don't want an overzealous cop. We do very, very careful with this program because it's such a, such a great tool. Down in Florida, they take it surreptitiously. We don't, I don't do that up here. Again, the priority is to have the A and the B swab. We have never had a DNA profile differ in the lab from the rapid machine, never. We validate, we just got a new machine, we're doing validations right now, we're down, so we can't do DNA right now because we're going through the validation process. And we work very closely with our private lab. The state police, the state lab really doesn't want anything to do with me right now. Real quick, just give you some examples. I still got a, a few minutes. Yeah, give you two more minutes. Um, just some real examples, because again, my priorities are not homicide and sexual assault because I don't get them, thank God. We get a lot of thefts. We get criminals off the street immediately. You don't, can't read it, but the red box is a stolen car from one municipality in Bucks County. The orange box, the car was recovered. We swabbed that car for DNA. It went to our private lab. We got results back in 30 days. The DNA sat in our database from that steering column. The green box is we lock up a guy, unknown that he was in any relationship to the red box. The blue box, we run him through the rapid machine, and he winds up hitting a bunch of stolen cars. Now, that's pretty cool. I mean, at the end of the day, that's pretty neat stuff. This is a guy we would have never been able to link together because I'm not sure if the state CODIS lab would have ever, ever, you know, processed this stuff anyway. And if it did, how many more cars, cars would he have been stolen? The same thing with these two boxes. These are just retail thefts from a uh, grocery store where the top box, he's, as he's running out the store, he drops the bag behind. That police department swabs that bag. It goes in our local database, the, the evidence the forensic sample and the reference sample, we get the guy a couple months later, about six months later, stealing again. And then the rapid machine hits on him immediately to numerous thefts. This is all pretty good stuff. We've also used this for um, innocence. We had a, a woman, 69 years old, very credible, appeared to be very credible, accused a guy of rape positively identifies him. He's a Megan's Law offender. He's got no alibi. His car is in the, in the vicinity of the sexual assault. We arrest him. We put him in jail. He, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I would have done it. I would have, I would have, I would have confessed. He's, he confessed to his last jobs. The detective says, something's wrong. There's, something's wrong with this. Winds up, there was a, a cup left at the scene. We put, we rushed that cup through our local database. We didn't buckle swab him. He didn't do it. He was innocent. We got him out of jail. Now, he wasn't in there for 18 years. He was only in there for four days. But that was four days too long. We got him out. So we're using this for exoneration. I don't know if those of you that are local, familiar with this quadruple homicide that we had in 2017 in our county where four boys were killed. The boys were, three boys were buried in one grave. Another one was buried about a half mile away. 
and um, the boys were uh, beyond recognition. The DA wanted to make sure that we can bring all the boys home and identify them to the parents at the same time. So we utilized, we got their toothbrushes, sent them down to our private lab. They did a 24-hour rush on it, and then the coroner was able to swab the boy's mouth, and we were able to identify each of the boys for the parents. That's pretty priceless. So it's not just about locking up bad guys and preventing crime. It's also about exoneration. It's also about victim identification. This particular crime as well, we were able to swab different parts of the crime scene with blood to also help lead us to, you know, where, where the boys' bury, uh, bodies were buried. So this is pretty... Uh, this is a pretty powerful tool. Uh, I'm from New York City originally, so I'm a, Bill, a big Bill Bratton fan who was the police commissioner in New York twice. Bill says, Commissioner Bratton uses this phrase, knowing your assailant will be caught is a lot less comforting to a citizen than the confidence you won't be attacked in the first place. What does that mean? Our job is to prevent crime. I will use all tools allowed at my disposal and all, at all laws that I'm allowed to utilize to do that job. Some people don't like it. Okay, I get it. We're very careful. Um, we think we're very careful. Um, and we haven't had any issues so far. Thank you. Before we get that up, I think it's really good that Chief went first there because it is encouraging to me to see this technology get used responsibly and successfully. Uh, Kentucky, I think, is another good example of where they've been using rapidly, rapid, pretty responsibly and successfully. I've talked a lot with Laura Sidecamp there. I don't know if you've had a chance to talk with her. Um, oops, going backwards here. Wrong button, there we go. Uh, so I drone on a lot with my staff that the wrong answer quickly really is no better than the right answer late. As Chief's pointing out, it doesn't really do us any good to have an answer 18 months late. It does nobody any good. It's just a frustration. But honestly, in forensic laboratories, the 60% 60 60 problem that I've got is resources. We talk a lot about gizmos. We talk a lot about science stuff. And there are real science issues in forensic science that we can't ignore. Mixture interpretation, how many points of minutia make up a valid latent print, all of these things. But that's the 5% problem. And rapid is kind of a classic in this. It's a great gizmo, it holds enormous promise. But my 35% problem is how evidence gets handled. It's all the stuff around the gizmo. It's an engineering problem. So that's pretty much it for what I have to say. <laughs> but I'm a scientist. I will now belabor the point with pictures. <laughs> um, so this is a latent lift card. It's a real high-tech thing because I've heard a number of times from both of the manufacturers of these boxes, this is as easy as collecting a latent print. So a latent print card is a high-tech piece of paper and a piece of tape. I dust for the print, I take the tape, I pick up the dust, I stick it on a card. So here's the card. You got one big grubby fingerprint on one end, one big grubby fingerprint on the other end. Whose prints do you think those are? Yes. Yeah. It's the officer that collected the prints. Oh, and there's not much in between. It gets even better on the back of the card when he describes what he did. You, you see the issue here? You <laughs> used white powder, right? It's a white card. And then how'd you get black fingerprints on there? Collecting fingerprints is not an easy thing. Off of property crimes, we rarely get a useful print. And when we do, the majority of the time, it points back to the officer that collected the prints. <laughs> so obviously, officers carry weapons. You would hope they know how to use them. However, in the land of forensic uh, firearms examination, that orange zip tie is used to demonstrate that the, officer, that the weapon has been rendered safe. <coughs> I'm not sure, you know, this is, this is East Coast and it's not Texas. Texas, they give you a handgun when you come into the state. Not everybody's familiar with, with firearms, but that's not safe. I get weapons all the time with a live round in the chamber. It's the handling of the evidence. It's not a science issue, it's an engineering issue, it's a training issue, it's not 
Easy. I get 500, I get 500 weapons a month. I get stuff like this all the time that's then asked for DNA and latent prints. Whose? <laughs> how am I, how, I, so I've taken to rejecting things like this, but that creates a whole other host of issues. So these instruments hold enormous promise. This is probably the most common thing I see. Every lab in the country struggles with this. Every lab in the country struggles with all the other ones I've been showing. So y'all are a bunch of lawyers. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> they didn't sign it across the actual seal. Exactly. The actual seal on the opening end of the envelope is just a piece of tape. I get this all the time. Basically, if you talk with your laboratories, you talk with any lab, if I were to reject stuff like this, I would do almost nothing. I would reject almost everything. It's a documentation issue. It's a detail issue. It's a training issue. It's an engineering issue. So when we start talking a little closer to actual DNA, this was an actual scene. Also involved shooting. You know, one of this is kind of high profile case. So we spent two years struggling with trying to get everyone at the scene to do things like wear gloves when there's a dead body and blood around. So now we have an inner cordon around the crime scene areas that are the most sensitive, the red tape. So red tape's there, yay. Inside that cordon right now, there's a couple investigators, gloves, booties, masks, yay. Well, one of them's missing gloves. All right, close enough. The shooting actually occurred early in the morning. So the darker it gets, the nearer to the time of the shooting that it happened. So still there's a red tape there, booties, gloves, masks, yay. Because why? You spew DNA all the time. You transmit DNA all the time. A little earlier still, inside the tape, booties, gloves, talking to the guy outside the tape, no gloves, no booties, okay, good. Before my crime scene guys got there, no red tape. Patrol, 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 patrol. You can kind of see, actually I guess I can do it here with this. Right here is the weapon, there's a um, blood pool there with a the assailant was shot, no booties, no gloves, no masks. A little bit earlier still, there's the blood pool, there's the go, no masks, no masks. I feel like mom most of the time, <laughs> when mom's not watching, but that doesn't mean no DNA is transferring. And my favorite in all of this, this is in the paper. The media is standing right there taking a picture of this. He is all over the gun. That gun became a mixture. Didn't have to be. It's training, it's engineering, it's not a science issue. So this has become the poster child of what's happened in Houston. Um, so Houston has had a pilot, and I can, trust me, I can talk all day about this, um, that the idea was, can we validate this for use on crime scene evidence? Huge power, huge potential. This was a piece of glass that came from a burglary. Blood stain at the point of entry, probably the perpetrators. You can see the kind of documentation that we do in the lab. You know, here's the laboratory, the analyst's initials, all of the documentation of it. We do photographic documentation of this. Here's the portion that we sampled. Unfortunately, on this piece of evidence, we had an instrument failure, lost the batch that this was in. So we went back to resample it. When we went back to resample it, this is what we had because it got sampled for rapid. This had no chain of custody entry for who did it. I know the officer who did it. <clears throat> Believe me, there were words. The problem here is he sampled everything. So this turned out from a piece of evidence that probably had the offender's profile on there, its blood, we probably could have gotten a CODIS eligible hit off of it, and now there is nothing all because of sample handling. Not science, not the box, sample handling. So HPD swabbed 277 items across 72 cases. We've been sorting this out since January because in January I found out that the manufacturer of this box went behind everybody's back, sampled 11 sexual assault victims, 
sent those to the manufacturer's laboratory, never told anybody, never disclosed any of the data, never disclosed any of the reports. Took me months to get hold of the data to compare anything. Caused me to ask a lot of questions about what had happened with the rest of this. We've got Brady notifications. There have been about two dozen Brady notifications in cases. There are five cases that had guilty pleas, and I still don't know how probative or material the DNA was in those cases. So, Chief, thank you for being more responsible about how you're doing this. It's the other company. Yeah. <laughs> Not my Keep company. In mind, there are only two flavors of these boxes. Yes. That's it. Both companies have been remarkably aggressive, but right now the one that Chief's using, they're behaving themselves a whole lot better. So these are basically the summary of issues that I've got. And you will see nowhere up there is a sciencey thing. How do we ensure the evidence is not consumed? How do we cons ensure the evidence is not contaminated, is not destroyed, is not altered? How do we ensure the documentation of evidence? What is the potential for retesting? These instruments consume what's in there. Now, the one that Chief's using consumes far less, and actually there's an ability to retest what's been used on the instrument. The other instrument that's been in Houston consumes it, gone. Those 11 sexual assaults, the male fraction is completely consumed. There is no recovery in it. Data storage, who stores the data? Where does it go? How is it secured? Who gets access to it? How is it disclosed? How is it reported? Right now, these reports say match, non-match, or possible match. No statistics. That's basically going back about 25 years in the advancement of forensic science. Maintenance and calibration, all of these things about how that box works and validation of the box. Those are the things I worry about. So I'm from Texas. I'm not that bright. There's the box, OK? It's everything outside the box that I'm worried about. The box themselves are probably pretty OK. There's some real issues there. There's stuff to consider. But more my concern is everything outside the box. So did I hit 10 minutes? You did. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Uh, thanks very much. It's nice to be here for a second time. Um, I, I love what uh, you guys do here. I think it's absolutely amazing and, and essential. Um, we don't use rapids in my lab. The, the only um, foray I had into that was when someone was pitching a, a show to the History Channel, uh, and we went and um, poked holes in the Hatfield and McCoy graves. And they wanted us to use a rapid machine for that. And um, I decided not to because um, I, I just didn't think, and this was a, more than a year ago, just didn't think the technology was uh, ripe for sensitive samples. So we took those samples to lab. Um, I think our, our speakers pretty much set up the whole problem. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I do, um, which mostly is dealing with errors in the system. So. I'm not the person who makes the peanut butter. I'm the one who says there's salmonella in this batch. <laughs> and um, that's what my, my role uh, principally in the justice system has been. So in order to explain this, we heard about all the great successes that these machines can do. Uh, that's always true with every new instrument. And um, so I offer this. If we measure the justice system by the number of truly guilty people convicted. Did we get the right guy? Is he in prison? Then the Salem witch trials were an astounding success because more than 100% of the witches were convicted. <laughs> so um, just because we're getting guilty people off of the streets uh, doesn't mean that we should rush into a technology. So what are the kind of concerns that we might have for this? Well, initially, the rapids were sold to us in the forensic science community as this is just going to be for reference samples. So you have a suspect, and uh, you want to uh, give them a swab, and you want to find out right away, does this person match evidence that has been properly um, DNA analyzed in a laboratory? And that sounds like a sensible thing, because you can let someone go if they don't match. Uh, and if they do match, it's, it's called a investigative lead, right? Let's be honest about what an investigative lead is, however. Um, 
An investigative lead is what is used to get people to confess. And as we heard, people, when they hear that their DNA is a match, confess. Now, confession is not the gold standard. I know that because I've worked on now more than two dozen exonerations, and about 25% of those, the people confessed. So confession is not, a, is not anything that should allow us to sleep well at night. And when someone is told that their DNA matches, I think that's a, that's a very strong indication that they better start thinking about making a deal. And I'll give you an example. But the issues with the rapids I've just summarized here, the how, nobody's gonna argue about. I think we all agree the technology's fine. Um, it's the who, who is doing this, who is taking the DNA, from whom is it being taken, um, what are they taking it from, what kind of samples, where are they doing this, and why are they taking it. So uh, if we just took everybody's DNA in this room, that might be a fair way to do it. And that way, if there's a murder here tonight, and they find your cup, or they swab the desk that you're sitting in, and your DNA comes up, well then you'll be investigated. And that's the reality for people who are in the federal database. You better remember where you were seven months ago. <laughs> and you better have a receipt. The guys um, who I've helped get out of prison when we go to Walmart and go shopping afterwards, they all wave at the cameras, <laughs> they all keep their receipts, because a receipt would have saved them a couple of dozen years uh, in prison. The issues are also the databases. What are these databases? Um, where are these databases? There is no national registry of local police databases. In fact, no one really knows how many there are. They're uncontrolled, uh, and they take samples from victims, from uh, cigarette butts that are found, etc. Your DNA may, in fact, be in one of these databases. Um, contamination and errors at collection. I don't like the idea of someone swabbing me next to a murder scene. I don't like the idea of if I happen to be in the hallway and they're collecting evidence, they're also going to take my DNA at the same time. I always say, don't put your arsenic in an old spice bottle. And if you do, don't keep it with the other spices. We have to have separation between swabbing somebody and um, collecting evidence. Um, certainly prejudice is a, is a problem we heard in the first session today, and we know who we're, who's going to get swapped. And we know who knows not to speak to the police and who can hire a lawyer and who's just going to try to get out of there as quickly as possible. Finally, the question of consent, which we'll take a look at. What is consent? Um, I love that people can just call in and get their uh, dad out. How many people have done that? Less than 20. Less than 20. Um, and I, I'm sure it's far less than 20. <laughs> I'm going to guess. Because once people get swallowed up in the system, um, they remain in the system. So I think the idea that you can expunge things is, is, um, uh, is kind of a pipe dream. It just doesn't happen. OK. Uh, I wrote a piece for the New York Times, a little bit of uh, was referred to today, the study I was talking about, where 74 out of 108 crime laboratories falsely included someone in a mixture. These are trained analysts, uh, the best people in the country. And yet, when they were given a scenario of a crime by the National Institute of Standard Technology, they produced a false result along with statistics. How much more susceptible to the same type of human bias, which we all have, is an officer at the scene who's trying to close something down with all the chaos that happens at a scene. What about this idea of they confessed? Well, so this is my favorite example of this. In Las Vegas, the police apologized for an error. In the forensic lab, um, they had suspects DNA and the tubes are, you know, the size of your pinky nail that these uh, DNA samples are on. They're in a little tray about the size of an iPhone. There are 96 of them. And there's no way to write on these things. You have to remember the order you put them in and there's systems to try to help you. But mix-ups happen just like they happen at the drive through at the, the uh, fast food place. It's human error. It's not bad people. 
And so in this case, two suspects were being questioned about a kidnapping uh, and robbery. And um, one of them was told, your DNA matches. What do you think that person did? Well, you folks are lawyers. You know the conversation a lawyer would have with a client at that point. It would be something like, well, we can go to trial. They have DNA. Uh, if you're convicted, 25. If you confess, probably eight, maybe 12. That's what this guy was told. He confessed. He went to prison. He was there for three years. The uh, California lab contacts the Vegas lab and says, oh, we have a match to that forensic sample you loaded up to CODIS. They're like, no, you don't because he's in prison. No, we have him. He's right here. No, he's in prison. They argued. Everybody re-swabs. Guess what? Vegas had switched the tubes by accident. Now, that's a very, very rare case. And the reason it's rare is you will never find out about a tube swap. You will never find out about suspect contamination to evidence because there is no difference in the result from a normal result. No one will know. And as I said, people confess. So the rest of us are kind of untroubled by that. This is uh, my latest case uh, where we overturned a conviction. This is uh, Johnny Lee Gates. Uh, it was a 1976 conviction for murder. He's still sitting in prison, but his um, murder conviction has been overturned as they argue uh, the appeal in the courts. And um, it's a DNA case. We were able to use new probabilistic genotyping. I have a grant from the uh, Department of Justice. They are not endorsing anything I say. Um, but um, when we got him out, one of the students who was investigating this went back and found that um, they had struck all black jurors on capital cases in this county, except two, I think, uh, over many, many, many years. And they did that in Johnny Lee Gates's case. And the judge was very concerned about this, but said that uh, because of legal reasons, that couldn't result in a new trial. We had to do it with the DNA. The reason I show this is that prejudice will be part of all of these systems. It will be the usual suspects who end up in the databases. And let's be honest, these, these rapids are principally of use for building databases. It is exactly why 23andMe will sell you a DNA test for, what is it, $99, $199 now? They, when they first started this, were losing a lot of money on that kind of testing. They want a database. Everybody wants a database. Certainly the local police departments do. Um, so what about this consent? Um, you know, consent is something that's in the news a lot lately, mostly um, in the colleges when we talk about sexual consent. So I took uh, John Donne's poem to his mistress going to bed. I won't read the whole thing to you. Um, wonderful uh, consent poem where he's trying to get someone to consent to do something. In fact, he's trying to get an intimate uh, encounter. It's no different than an intimate swab. It, it needs to be taken for one purpose only. The idea that we're putting you in a database is already in perpetuity. The default is in perpetuity. It is not for a single investigation. There's no reason to put someone in a database for a single investigation. That is hoodwinking to be uh, gentle with that. You put someone in a database because you think they're going to be a future offender. Um, it's limited to specific use when it's consent. John Dunn does not get, if she says yes, permission to ravish her always. It's not transferable to other agencies. He can't call his friends. Privacy is assumed, and it can be easily revoked. In this case, we've heard with a phone call, but I'll tell you that people do not revoke um, their uh, database DNA. Finally, I'd like to uh, quote Justice Scalia, who dissented on the swabbing of arrestees and said that the proud men who wrote the Charter of Our Liberties uh, would have been, he doubted that they would have been so eager to open their mouths for royal inspection. And um, that's, that's really the point here, is that these rapid systems Yes, they'll help with a lot of property crimes. They have a lot of potential. But the great um, 
uh, question is, do we want these local databases that are basically in perpetuity, that are the usual suspects, and that can be gathered from things as simple as chewing gum at a playground, uh, uh, cigarette butts at a park. All of that goes into a database because there is no regulation on these databases. And I'll end it with that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks to all uh, the fascinating presentations and I think have really set up our discussion. So we have uh, some questions from the audience. I'm going to ask a couple of things to get us started. Uh, you know, after hearing you and, you know, from looking into this issue and, and seeing how it's come in, in contact with the criminal justice uh, world, it seems like there's two big categories of concerns. One is the procedures and protocols about evidence collection and how the machines are going to be used. And then the other is what happens to that information after it's been processed and potentially goes into these databases. And so one of the things that struck me was thinking about this in terms of just the proliferation of new and cheap and accessible technology and how that impacts the way that it's used. So I want to set this up with a, a comparison and then get your thoughts individually on this. And it should be apparent at this point why this group was chosen, because I tried to uh, want to make sure we're discussing this from the perspectives of three different stakeholders that all have different interests. Uh, for the for their particular role. So, you know, it reminded me w one thing that seems an obvious comparator for new technology is the advent of smartphones and iPhones. And a statistic that is fascinating to me is the proliferation of imagery and digital images. And so, without going back pre-digital photography, but just going back to 2011, in 2011 there were 400 billion digital images that were generated. Half of those by smartphone, half of those by digital camera. In 2017, there were one point trillion images generated, and 85% of those were generated from a smartphone. And that's in the context of having sort of a, a, a monolithic supplier of photography prior to digital photography, which was Kodak. And contrary to the adamant protestations of uh, Simon and Garfunkel, Kodachrome was taken away, and Kodak ultimately filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2011, and labs stopped processing Kodak films, slide films, in 2010. So that was a, an overly long setup for the question, which is, if this technology becomes more and more available and you start having police districts all across the country taking in these large collections of samples and DNA data grows at this exponential rate that the technology now allows, is it possible that that could become the baseline for DNA testing in terms of frontline investigations and shut out the traditional forensic lab. And if that is possible, how can we go about preparing the necessary guardrails and protections to either prevent that, if that's an unworkable new standard, or to make sure that that's being done in a way that's consistent with the principles we want to employ for scientific integrity across forensics. So with that ridiculously long question, I turn it over to you folks. And you know, I'll ask you first, uh, Director Aaron, so you have a chance to sort of respond to those issues and, and tell us your thoughts. Certainly, I think um, as the technology involves, more police departments are certainly going to come on board with having uh, rapid capabilities within the police department. People are starting to look at it now, a lot more police departments. As of today, I do not think, or any time in the very near future, it's going to take away the place of the labs. We do A and B swabs, we do check the work. Um, I still think you need the lab and, I, and you know, not to say in 15 years from now, the technology is just, and I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the means, the technology is just ridiculous that the lab is not needed. I don't know if that day is ever gonna come or not. Maybe, maybe not, like you said with Kodak, you know, who would have thought that that would change, but certainly it has, but you'll see more and more. And I think the FBI and the federal government are going to eventually put rules and regulations. Right now there are none. There are no rules and regulations on what we're doing. And I think as more and more people do it, and unfortunately, some of my colleagues are going to mess it up. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, they're going to mess it up. We're very, very careful because I don't want, I like what we're doing because I see the results. But certainly in, as time comes, more and more police departments, they're more talking about it right now that are looking to purchase these machines. And there's only two companies that are making it. And I think one is better than the other, in my opinion. Um, 
So y you're going to see that. I don't know if it'll ever take away the place of the lab, but rules will come out regarding this. And I think CODIS is going to have to change its ways. Uh, CODIS is 23, 24 years old. Uh, the technology is different now. Um, and I think either the state labs are going to have to pick up their game, uh, getting more resources. Uh, not that they're doing anything wrong, just get more resources and the government's going to have to fund them, or more people are going to look to the outside labs to expedite the processing. Would either of you like to comment on that? I, no, I mean, I, I, um, I, I appreciate that, um, that you talked about um, the, the officers and the investigation and, and that, that one exoneration. The, the, um, the problem with all the great technology from the, the um, seasoned detectives I've talked to uh, is that it is often a shortcut to an answer and a closing a case. And, um, and you wouldn't find out um, uh, the innocence of clients like the or people like you talked about if there wasn't someone checking all those facts. It's not just the DNA. I, I think the, uh, the, the important thing is to put more resources into traditional um, investigation, investigative techniques. The human aspect is still the most important. Because let's face it, DNA is the easiest thing in the world to plant. <laughs> and at some point, that becomes a real issue. Um, and DNA is the easiest thing to contaminate a place. So um, it used to be nobody, nobody would take a case, prosecutors would not take a case if there was just DNA. I mean, I remember those days, even 10, 15 years ago, it just wouldn't happen if that was the main facet of a case. You had to have more than that. Now these cold case grants that are going out to a lot of agencies, I, I see a lot of cases where it's just DNA because they're old cases. Nobody has receipts or memory even of what happened. And it's a DNA hit and oftentimes people are presented, well, your DNA matched this you know, crime from 15 years ago. <laughs> Do you want to try to fight it? And people aren't, aren't capable of fighting that. So um, I just like to see more resources with the traditional uh, investigations. So I think as the, as the crime lab nerd here, a couple of things I would try and help put in perspective on that. For most of the laboratories doing casework in the country, DNA casework makes up somewhere between 4 and 14% of the casework that goes through the labs. Half of the casework that goes through the labs is either toxicology or controlled substances, drug identification. So as far as the total number of cases that laboratories handle, DNA is a tiny portion of what we do. Now, some of that is because DNA evidence isn't collected in all of these cases, but DNA is not probative in the majority of cases out there. It gets a huge amount of attention because it is something that can identify directly an individual, but so can latent prints. And latent prints are about a tenth the cost of DNA. Um, so latent prints still are hands down the workhorse of individuation and the concerns about latent prints are real and we need to take those seriously. Um, I also think as another perspective, STR based DNA, which is what these instruments do and what the laboratories do, broadly speaking, is the workhorse of DNA, is, is, a, is a dead end. I mean, it's, it's dying. Next-gen sequencing is what ST is going to be to STRs what STRs were to RFLPs. Um, these, now whether that takes 10 years or whether that takes five years or whether that takes 15, I don't know. Right now, SNP-based testing is very lengthy, but SNPs offer an a, a true opportunity to how we deconvolute mixtures much more, much better. Now, sobering thing to keep in mind is because of the you know heritage fad that we've got going on it was reported not too long ago that regardless whether or not you have submitted your dna to an ancestry.com or a 23andme or one of those with a bare couple of assumptions i can impute the identity of anyone in the country there's that much data already out there so that's outside of CODIS, that's all privately owned, that's all independent of any oversight and regulation. 
and it's not easy right now. I mean, the genetic genealogy stuff is not easy, but it will be getting easier. The instrumentation that produced these brute force SNP-based sequencing will get faster. They will get less expensive. And honestly, these, these rapid instruments have a, have a, have a lifespan. Thank you for that. I think that, you know, you've all given excellent observations of that sort of overarching issue, which I think is, is one that it's impossible to talk about this without getting into this sort of dreams of a DNA apocalypse from having all of that information out there, as you've described. You know, I want to talk, switch, switch gears a little bit to what uh, has come up several times about procedure and the things outside the box, as you, as you described, Dr. Stout. And so it sounds like, uh, from what Director Heron said that there are no regulations or any rules in terms of how they're using these machines and the protocols they develop for evidence collection that's going to be used in the machines. And while Director Heron has, has very responsibly developed protocols for his use of the machine, what happens uh, when police departments are doing things like cigarette butts and gum, which are things that are high likelihood of single source DNA, but they run those samples uh, what is the possible implication of destroying evidence or using up and consuming the available DNA reference uh, in that first hit when it's being done locally in a rapid machine? What's the risk of that with those kinds of samples in particular? You? We, you know, we don't, we don't run it. And I'm not the guy that runs it. So, but we're not running... Um, samples if we don't have enough for both. So the primary is going to the lab. If we don't have enough, it's going off to the lab. Uh, otherwise, we won't put it into the rapid machine. Primarily, the rapid machine is used for reference samples. That's where we use it the most. Get someone in custody, do a, a buckle swab, and we're not swabbing people at crime scenes. So they can't be you know, spitting and dropping their DNA while we're swabbing them at a crime scene. They're being swabbed in a controlled setting back at the police department. So they're not being swabbed at crime scenes. They're being swabbed in the police department. So primarily, it's you know, probably over 90% we're using it just for reference. Okay. And do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I guess, I guess what I would say is I'm not sure yet. Um, I think there are starting to be some validation studies of how big a blood spot is big enough to reliably have enough DNA there for both rapid and traditional testing and that those will be consistent. Reality is there's a risk always in all of this that I swab a blood stain with one swab, the next swab will have something different. Either there will be inhibitors in that first swab because there's more fats in it from the first swab it's going to behave differently than the next swab. Um, buckle swabs are far more reliable, but even there, we run across occasionally, they aren't single source. I won't go into details of how that happens, but it happens. We also run across, and we have to instruct people pretty carefully to twist the swab while they're taking it because they will end up with all the DNA on one side of the swab. In our laboratory, we're very deliberate about we never consume more than half of the available evidence. So we will cut that swab in half and run half of that swab. Well, if I cut the swab off, side off the swab that they didn't get around to the cheek, not much DNA there. Not every swab's the same. So there's always a risk of it, but I can't say how, is that a huge risk or is it a small risk? I can say the risk of things getting poorly collected, poorly documented, poorly packaged is big. Um, that is 30, I, I would estimate 30, 40% of the evidence we've got has something pretty fundamentally wrong with it. Um, and like I say, if I were to reject, if I were to be really picky about all the seals have to be correct, I would run basically nothing. Well, what, we had several questions come in that are very similar, and so I'll ask this to the extent you, you folks can address it. You've talked about that you believe the box itself sort of works and that your concerns are these other issues. How much do we know about the box itself in terms of how it's been validated, uh, the standards for calibration, and the things that we just want to know generally about whether or not that particular device is functioning properly? Anyone? <laughs> I mean, we validate utilizing our private lab. Our state lab won't have anything to do with it. Um, we utilize the private lab, and we do about 60, um, 60 70 swabs for the validation process. Um, 
And uh, again, if it's not generating a full profile, uh, either it's going to be manually reviewed, depending on the case, so we'll send that results off to the lab, um, and then they'll review it for us. But traditionally, it will just generate, if it generates a good XML file using 24 alleles, alleles then it'll just, it'll just check it against our database. Um, so I, I, I can eat the sausage. I don't know how it's made. Uh, <laughs> so what goes into the box itself? I'm not, I'm not the scientist. Um, but we do validate it, and everything, you know, as, as I had said during the presentation, we have not ever had since March of 2017 a result differ from the lab, from the machine. So to me, that's pretty good. Uh, I, I got to say, it, it's great you brought up that sausage one, because I, I have gotten <laughs> that one so many times. And usually the conversation goes with an investigator who, I mean, and I, we need police to be police. We desperately need them to do this impossible job. We want them to work the way that they're working. It's good. We want the lab to be able to work the way it is. But when I've got the circumstance of an investigator who is earnestly trying to get an answer quicker, that conversation I finally usually go, son, I don't care how the sausage is made. I just want my dinner on time. <laughs> to which my reply is, I appreciate that. But when that sausage poisons both you and me, you're going to care how that sausage yeah. got made. Um, I'm not entirely sure what a legitimate validation of these instruments means yet. There's a lot less that is controllable on the instruments. There's a lot more stuff that is fixed that I can't adjust. But for perspective, when I put a new chemistry online in the laboratory, that is about a year and a half long process. Uh, probably the number of samples that I will run is at least two orders of magnitude larger than 60. I will probably run thousands. Um, it is vastly more complicated than 60. Now, that's not to say that 60 isn't appropriate because these are much more structured instruments. Um, but certainly validation is more than plug it in, see if the lights turn on. I, I think the, uh, you know, we're, we're really talking two very different things. The reference samples, which I imagine your validation was only with buckle swabs, right? Not with mixtures? We're, we're using uh, evidence too now. But was that valid? Did you validate that? I don't. Uh, I don't know to answer that. I mean, that's the that that's the difficult thing. I, as I said, I think the basic technology to to produce a single person STR profile is probably very solid. The concerns there are, are purely for what it actually is for, and that's to build databases in a way that is uncontrolled uh, and has not been uh, properly vetted, in my view, um, or or litigated at this point. But the, um, the analysis of evidence is far more complex because it's, as you saw, uh, uh, as we referred to, uh, these mixtures are misinterpreted by experts. Um, and these machines um, have not been uh, um, validated for that type of analysis that I know of. So that, that's one concern about doing uh, crime scenes. And what are the officers telling people? <laughs> Uh, you're kind of you're a match, <laughs> you know. Uh, that that type of thing in a laboratory is something that um, that can go wrong. But there's a lot of care that goes into determining a match between evidence and a person. So um, I have a serious problem with the idea that these things are being used for for evidence in in the field, because they'll work 90% of the time. But 10%, 5%, you're going to have these complex mixtures. And um, people will be told they're a match, and they, they're not a match. And then they will be put in a position like the person in Vegas. So uh, two very, very different things. Uh, and I, I doubt that these systems have been validated for, uh, for evidence the way uh, they need to be. You know, and following up on that, uh, one of the things that came up, too, was sort of the incidence of uh, confessions as a result of getting the DNA samples and sort of what confessions mean and obviously what we know uh, looking at the system as a whole and in the innocence community about confessions and the, and the dynamics that go on with those. Uh, how, do we th how do we sort of even understand now what the potential scope of that issue is? Because you know, we talk about one of the, the, the places that's been using DNA technology uh, at an early phase is Orange County, which has a program that is uh, you know, endearingly called spit and acquit, 
where defendants actually have the option of providing DNA to a database and then they get a very generous uh, diversion uh, for their criminal case, um, where there is, is clearly sort of a, a, a carrot on a stick there for providing that information and then obviously as, as, as it's been discussed, that goes into the database and has lots of implications later. How can we potentially even know based on the way that there's whatever regulation or sort of information is coming out of police departments in the original investigations, how often that practice is happening and how specifically uh, the DNA and the ability to do it quickly is being used in that early investigative process. So, uh, you know, and that's, that's why I'm really concerned with this, um, uh, this comment that the people confess and that I, I'm going to guess that principally these DNA matches, and I think it was inferred, are an instrument to obtain confession. And um, I, you know, I've worked with a lot of people who've spent a lot of time in prison, and I, I asked them about this issue because um, many of them did falsely confess. Some of them ratted out friends, some of them didn't. And um, the way I would put it is this, if I told you I had a signed confession, you know, full consent, it's videotaped, and the person said I did it and gave details, you'd probably say that's a good confession. If I told you, well, what you didn't see under the table is they were pulling his fingers off as they were doing this, you might think it was coercive. But when I have asked, and I've asked every person now uh, the last few years who's gotten out that I've met, I said, uh, would you give, I have an odd question, but would you have given three or four of your fingers to avoid your incarceration for two decades? And everyone says yes. Uh, the, the point is, when you're offering people a deal and telling them there's DNA, take the deal, that is, is coercive beyond torture because you're talking about not seeing your children grow up in these serious cases, maybe not in property crime, not seeing your parents die. Uh, all of these things are implied when you say, well, look, there's DNA against you, confess, you'll get 10 years knocked off your sentence or any, any of these type of uh, inducements. And the reality is, even with the CODIS hits, um, the, the only studies I saw, and this was a few years back, like, the, you know, we have this great database and they'd get hits to the database and someone did the study in Louisiana of the first um, CODIS hits that resulted in um, uh, people, in cl cases being closed. They were all confessions. <laughs> no, none of these went to court. So <coughs> DNA is a, um, is such an instrument um, that it brings about confessions, whether, whether someone is uh, uh, um, truly guilty or not. And I think if I were put in that position, um, I, I would certainly consider which way to go. There's a couple of issues. One is um, certainly I'm not going to sit here and say out of 900,000 police officers in the United States, you don't have some monkey business going on. I'm sure you do, but you have that, whether you're putting sh toilet paper on the shelves at Walmart, somebody's doing it wrong, doctors, lawyers, engineers, there's bad in every profession. So I, I'm not willing to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. Um, and we're talking about f f the confessions at the scene versus when you're wheeling and dealing, trying to figure out what's my plea negotiation. I think there's some time, but when I came on in 87, uh, I remember an officer using a, a portable breath test, as if you remember the old Star Trek, the, the tricorder, telling prisoners, this will make you tell me the truth. I know if you're lying or not. And prisoners, oh, I did it. You know, so we're allowed to use deceptive means. So if I said, I got your fingerprint, and we never got your fingerprint, and then the person confesses, is that legal or not? It's legal. Even though you made it up, you can't introduce a fake fingerprint in a court, that's a problem. But if you use that tool to get to someone to confess, you know, you're allowed to do that. So here we're usually utilizing DNA properly. We're not doing that with DNA. And we're not talking about at time of trial when, listen, you know, you're with your law lawyer and you're gonna get 25 years. If you confess, you're gonna get two years. I, I think that's, a, that's not what we're doing. We're getting it at time of arrest. You just hit to all these burglaries, I did it. It's not pulling fingernails off. It's not, you know, hours and hours without water and food and sleep deprivation. There's really, you know, television has done an injustice, you know, to this type of technology. Um, again, 
not to say out of 900,000 cops across the country, something's not going wrong somewhere. But that's why we're trying to make some rules and regulations and some best practices for people to follow. But if I'm that 45% of that, or the 55% of that sexual assault, and if you're one of those 55 that didn't get sexually assaulted in my town because we're doing some new and innovative legal uh, tools, you're gonna say do whatever you have to to prevent that crime. And I'm not by any means do we never want an innocent person to go to jail for a minute. And a matter of fact, the one case where the person was in jail for four days, we used DNA to exonerate that person. Nobody was complaining then. The other thing that people say all the time, and this kind of drives me nuts, is that it's racially biased. We take everybody's DNA. We just don't take African Americans or Hispanics or more African American males or you know people don't speak English. We take everybody's DNA that will give it up and we do it equally. And we don't know, all we know is that that person touched that item, male or female. It doesn't tell me that they're blue-eyed, green-eyed, they're predisposed to cancer, they're black, white, green, or from Mars. It doesn't tell me anything. It just says male, female, and that person touched that evidence. That's it. So good Sorry. news for me, <laughs> I don't have to deal with you know, some of this confession and interrogation part. That's, that's, that's not part of my scope. But it's also part of why I think you want the lab to not be part of that scope is so there actually is some separation of those responsibilities. What I can say is in CODIS hits and investigative lead reports that laboratories issue, we have a really big challenge getting investigators and DAs to understand what they need um, and actually use CODIS hits and understand that they got a CODIS hit and understand what a CODIS hit means and its limitations. Um, again, it's a training issue, it's engineering, it's how do we get the people to understand how to use the information that we're providing. Um, I, I, again, I don't think I can stress enough, and I know I drive some of my science colleagues nuts with, it just isn't a science issue. It's not gizmos and boxes. Really, the technology is the people in the process. It's something you mentioned just now about the sort of what CODIS hits mean and what their limitations are segues nicely into one of the questions that, that came in from the audience. The question is, and I'm going to try and summarize it a bit, it's a little complicated, uh, but I, I think this is what the question's asking. When any time you're running these comparisons or doing these things to try and determine a match, to use a totally unscientific term for yeah, what happens with DNA. Term. Yeah, I know. We've I know. been trying for 20 years to get rid I, of that. I know term. better than that, and yet I'm using it anyway. Uh, but so when that happens, that process that uh, will just remain nameless, you know, at this point, that when that's happening, there's always a chance that it's wrong, right? There's a chance that some error happened in connecting those two things. So. The question posed is, now that we're talking about the proliferation of these databases and the, the volume of data increasing perhaps exponentially, are we also now creating a new risk or an increased risk for that error occurring because we're constantly running those samples against a larger and larger database? And every time we run it, it's one more instance that it's, that it's happening. So is that creating a new uh, risk for possible errors in making that comparison, either through the database or in some other aspect of that process? I think simplistic answer is yes. Um, you know, again, science nerd, I can't let that just lie without belaboring it until everybody falls asleep. Uh, it is much more complex than that, than what the sources of error are, how people understand the risk of error, um, as a for instance, you know, we all have basically a one in 10,000 risk of dying next year. Your most likely reason to be injured or die next year is hitting your head on your toilet. But yet, we do all kinds of crazy things and we get worried about all kinds of other risks that by comparison just aren't real. You know, largely we have I, you know, I've got a job, I used to say when I was in the environmental industry, I had a job because people didn't know real risk from unreal risk. So I'm not sure, it's, it's really difficult for people to understand a good quality match, good quality association in DNA is, you know, out 
more than one in a million kind of risk ratio. But yet you say in a case, and I've seen this happen way too many times, something that's a one in 600 or one in 700 or one in 50 kind of odds ratio, and that will be probative, it will be material in court, and people will run with that. And that's basically not a real match, to again, use that term. So we can't even get that to work right now. We do this a whole lot more, yeah, it's gonna create more risk. Um, I, I can give you some specifics. Uh, so we use probabilistic genotyping and we've overturned seven convictions in, in uh, the last couple of years with it. Um, whereas the old technology, PCR, I could sit down with probably junior high students, you know, eighth graders, and explain how that works. With probabilistic genotyping, I mean, I've got a PhD, uh, took calculus two, I believe, years ago. I can't understand the mathematics in the, the instruments that I'm using. I have to hire people to do that who understand them. Um, so I think we've gotten to a very, very complex uh, system, this, the probabilistic systems. Now, that being said, they're better when you test the probabilistic software versus my eyes or other scientists' eyes looking at complex mixtures. These computers do better. The, the problem with the numbers is um, that that's what juries use for weight, right? So when we say one in 50, one in 200 quadrillion, that's what juries are using for weight. And we've been required since 2010, I guess, to report every match. I, when I say match, my students yell back statistic because I've taught them to do that. We have to have a statistic for every match statement. So when the National Institute of Standard Technology did that study that I talked about, it's basically a, a repeat of an earlier study, except this time they gave them stories, that they've been doing for the last 20 years or so. And the statistics, given the same DNA, and they just did this in Europe, same DNA and same software, the statistics vary by over 10 to the 10th. I think this last one, it was 10 to the 13th. So with the same exact data, you ask for that, that jury weight. Now, what is that difference? That's the difference between uh, soda change and the gross domestic product. That's for the same piece of evidence, right? And these are accredited crime labs. Now, are they doing something wrong? Is their math wonky? No, they just have different ways of doing it. But I'm not satisfied with my own explanation anymore. Because when I realized, well, wait a minute, we're talking about uh, if it was damaged to a bumper and you were in small claims, that's $30 or $300 billion, right? And you just cut it in half and I go home with $150 billion? Um, there's a problem with the statistics. It's getting more serious because the numbers are bigger. So with the new probabilistic software, what we're seeing is a, um, the, the statistic that will exclude you in Connecticut, say, is um, if it's you know, twice as likely that a, a random person matches the evidence as you, or that could, the evidence is explained by a random person, uh, twice as much, then, then you're excluded. In Georgia, it has to be a million times more likely for a random person to match that evidence than you, for you to be excluded. So um, I, think, I think there's actually potentially a Daubert challenge there because under the standards. Is there a standard in the field? Well, if the standard varies by that much, is there a standard? I don't know. It's becoming a, a more and more... Um, uh, kind of a troubling to my conscience question because I use these tools, but the fact that, these, that the weight is so different and that's what the jury has to decide, uh, has to, has to um, weigh, uh, and we're giving it to them as statistics. They will usually only see one set of statistics, that provided by the lab that did the work because to have another lab do it, you'd have to pay them you know, several thousand dollars. And so the juries don't know that it varies. And I don't know how you introduce that into court or give them proper, uh, you know, a proper way of doing that. Also, in the um, study that NIST did, I said they provided a statistic even when the person should have been excluded. And they, I think this average statistic was one, or the, it went up to one in 100,000 or something. So, so good news for me on that NIST 13 samples, we were one of the participating labs. We reported it inconclusive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There were only six laboratories <laughs> that correctly excluded that 
extra profile. So uh, to finish this up here, I, I, I'm going to do something a little bit unfair. I'm going to ask you each, I'm going to come down the row, starting with you, Director Heron, and just pose the question, if you were going to write the regulations for how these are being used, and you actually kind of are doing that, if you were going to write those regulations, what's your number one bullet point for what has to be regulated, kind of your one-sentence regulation that you would put in place for how these machines are being used nationwide? For today. For today, just rapid DNA being used in police departments, what's your number one bullet point of what should be regulated? Have to be able to be, uh, the work has to backed up by a lab. You just can't, you can't put every, all your eggs in one basket with a rabbit. You have to be able to be backed up by a lab and also training for, for law enforcement. Dr. Stell? One sentence. You're going to ask me to do one sentence. <laughs> Have I said one sentence about anything? I told you it was going to be unfair. <laughs> um, properly validated, proper evidence collection, and basically some kind of accreditation certification process around it so that you have at least a de minimis assurance that the instrument is properly handled and the personnel have, there's some leeway that the personnel know what they're doing. It's a lot of semicolons, but yes, you so run on a challenge. Yes. <laughs> yep. uh, and you, doctor. No rapid evidence and oversight of databases. All right, well, thank you very much.